Because I was 12, you know, hitting with people that were way older. But I kind of think it will be good if technology plateaus, because then it will basically everybody will be on an even playing field. And I think that that's what these paddle companies will tend to strive for. And that's such an untapped niche. I think most top players watch that match over and over because there's so much nuance out of that match that Roscoe and I brought to the table. I'll, I'll just say the percentage. I was <laughs> just. <laughs> I got my highest performing video finally over a million. I know, it's like... Is this a hater? Yeah, yeah, I mean... I think we talked about it before, but it's like... It's finding the perfect amount of tennis players to comment on your stuff in order to push it further. Uh -huh. But in order for them to not truly just like hate on you or follow you just to hate on you. That yeah. makes sense. No, that makes sense. Yeah, it's always like the same argument. Like, it's not a real sway, like... Yo, who cares? Like people, <laughs> people enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. I was like, what even makes like a real sport? There's like people play tag and like ultimate frisbee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And honestly, like tag, like I consider tag a real sport. That mean like, bro, that's <laughs> that's kind of fun. What even? What even makes a real sport? I mean, pickleball's in college now, right? Yeah, you're right. We had an event last night. You what? We had an event last night. Oh, did you? What was the event? Uh, it was, we, we had it at the ranch and it was just, uh, it was everything but a paddle night, but not many people pulled up with anything but a paddle. So we just, we just had a good night. Timmy talked about that. He mentioned that. Bro, Timmy is the best. <laughs> he, he's like, do you know Ryan DeWajid? He's like a mini Ryan DeWajid. <laughs> Dude. Dude, people have been saying that. No way, really? Uh-huh. <laughs> I think Timmy, maybe you said that to Timmy and then Timmy told me, He's, and I think he takes a lot of pride in that. And I don't know if many people would. Uh, people don't know who we're talking about. We're talking about Pickle Bald and Timmy. Who? Timmy, man, I met him at Sark. I always thought he was like a, he was like a good player. And then once I like, he, he, like, he was like kind of quiet and then he started opening up and I was like, Jesus Christ, this yeah. kid is... This kid's like yeah. off the hinge. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he's like your. Did you meet him through the college team? Mm hmm. Yep. Not, yeah, not even through Sark or Pan Am. Like, we both went to a college event and then just kind of hit it off from there. Well, right now he's the second best player at, at our school. So he's going to like travel and compete and do all that. Damn, that's yeah. dope. Mm -hmm. Is that thing okay? Yeah. <laughs> As long as the smoke, will the smoke show up? I hope so. It'll make it like look nice. Oh yeah, and I met that chick Zoya. Bro, Zoya's. Is it is like, it just me or is she like a good player? She's very good. Okay, like, yeah. Great strokes. Um, and she's getting better at thinking. Like yeah. she's got like, I mean, you know, the easiest part for the the easiest way for a tennis player to learn how to dink is just to hit a bunch of like aggressive rolls cross court because they can still like you know kind of swing away with their strokes, and she's like getting that down so she's like understanding how to dink which is gonna be huge that's awesome yeah i played with her randomly let me make sure this doesn't turn off i played her whether well, randomly at sark and then i met her at the merch shoot for ranchers super funny um because we were both like we're like the only ethnic ones here and she's like <laughs> she's like i think we're just here to meet the diversity quota <laughs> she says that. it's cool though man uh, um, welcome to another episode of Building Pickleball. Um, my guest today is Jack Monroe. Shout out to my sponsor, Viore. Welcome to Building Pickleball, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Appreciate dude. Um, for any of the people that don't know who you are, which shame on you if you don't, but for other people that don't know who you are, can you give like a quick intro? Rising pro star. I'd say that's a pretty overused term, but uh, uh been playing for the past eight, nine years now. Took a 
kind of hiatus in the middle of it. So now I'm back playing. Turns out there's a bunch of different stuff now, like the PPA and APP and all that stuff, which wasn't around back then. So I'm trying to uh, go pro. Obviously, I, you know, I'm trying to break in there right now, as well as make content. I think content's as big of an avenue, if not a bigger avenue than the pro avenue. So that's obviously a super big part of my brand. Yeah. Um, damn, there's a lot in that I want to pick apart in that but i think like if we're gonna take this in like chronological order there's like a lot of information out there or enough information about like how you start and all that so i won't get into that but you did start playing at the age of 10 and then uh for some people that don't know you know like you were like the youngest 5-0 pro player that was at age 12 mm -hmm. yeah but then you've played other sports like i remembered one of the videos you talked about how your fracture, you know, like a experience, a fractured growth plate during baseball. And that introduced you to pickleball from your dad, given you've played like various sports. Did you play tennis? No, okay. I didn't. I didn't at all. <laughs> yeah. So you played baseball. What else? Pickleball, uh, baseball and then basketball, basketball. Then, okay. Yeah. Yeah. What draws you to pickleball over those two other sports? Honestly, now it's a social aspect. I mean, I was drawn to it. Um, originally with the injury so it was just easy to go around and hit a ball which is why some people complain that it isn't a sport because it's so easy like the barrier to entry is so low um, but that allowed me to get in and still be social um, it allowed me to mature a bit faster as well because I was 12 you know hitting with people that were way older um, that that was that was one of the cool things about it but um one of the things that stood out with pickleball as well was there was a huge community behind it. Like high school basketball, there's a community behind it. Baseball, you know, you're traveling with your, you're traveling with your baseball team. But um, with pickleball, I felt I f if it, it was it was a different feeling that I got from it. I mean, it truly felt more so like family. And no matter where where you came from, you could honestly go there and just have a blast. A lot of people, like I feel like a lot of people don't really know what, myself included, don't really know what the game was like back then compared to like probably in the past like few years when it like really started to explode, which is like 2020. What's been like different from when you played back then to once you got back into it? There's a lot of things to unpack in terms of the difference between now and then, but some of the biggest ones were the difference in technology. I mean, back then you had like zero grit on the paddle. Um, like people were just experimenting with different cores and stuff like that. You don't have the tech like the carbon fiber or the Kevlar or anything like that that people are starting to implement today. Um, you had, there was no such thing as a true pro. So all the divisions were 5.0 or like 19 plus or something like that. There was no true pro, meaning that also nobody, like you traveled, but it was mostly out of pocket. Like it was tough to find a sponsor that paid you um, to travel because pickleball was so young. Um, Tournaments, you know, you'd play in a tournament and then you get like three, four hundred bucks for getting first place or something like that. I mean, it was it was way different back then. Everybody had a job. You know, the everybody everybody that was like pro or the best back then, it was just a thing to do on the weekend. It was um, in terms of how the sport has changed, um, obviously due to the technology, now you can do a lot more with spin, a lot more a lot more with power. So shots were a lot flatter back then. You couldn't really speed up from your knees the way you can now. So if you go back and watch a lot of film, you'll see that people have like hip high balls, but they like dink it back and dink it back. So that's where the, that's kind of where the, you know, where people say like it's such a slow sport because they, they watch back then and they see that people just dinked and dinked and dinked for 40 balls every single rally because nobody was able to be aggressive because of that. Um, so that was a big difference. People loved to lob. People loved to just hit like just super high balls that landed in the kitchen and nobody sped up off of it. Just there was no such thing as truly being aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, you can go back and watch the film. It is. It's so funny because people will have like literally chest high balls and they're just like push it back. They'll just like dink and keep dinking and keep dinking until somebody misses. And that's where, you know, that's where the bad rep kind of comes from. I guess it's definitely changing now. I think they said there's going to be like 382 new paddle brands or paddles introduced in 2024. Which is a quarter of all the paddles out there, right? I mean, right now, how many paddle brands are there? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy getting hit up by paddle brands. Um, and 
them pushing their product and you're like, is this really different? Or is this <laughs> like the same thing? Yeah. Uh, even you could see even Timu now was, um, is promoting like their pickleball paddles and it's literally, it has the Yola logo on it. It just doesn't have the Ben John stamp. It doesn't have anything like that. They're promoting it. I mean, I've seen it on Instagram all the time through the targeted ads and it's literally the Perseus, but, and it, and it has the Yola, the Yola little triangle on it. But, um, they're just branding it as their own. Is it like half the price? Uh, I mean, I, I never checked, but I would 100% <laughs> say so. You mean you didn't <laughs> buy it, dude? <laughs> Damn, yeah. that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I remember when I was looking up, you're doing like some research on you. This is crazy. There's like a game with you, William Sobic, Anna Lee, and then like, is it Robert Elliott's daughter? Yep, yep. Rachel Elliott. Rachel Elliott. Mm -hmm. What happened? Do you know what happened to her? Honestly, I don't think she ever had any desires to go pro in pickleball. So she's just, I think she's working for Engage on the back end still. Oh, damn. Um, so yeah, like, like we still talk and keep in touch. And Josh Elliott, which is the brother um, of Rachel Elliott, um, okay. you know, plays and travels. He's, he's a high level player. Like he qualifies and stuff like that. But it's obviously tough to travel when qualifiers are on Tuesday or Wednesday. And then it's also a plane ticket, housing, registration is like a grant. So yeah. it's tough. For some of the people that don't know, like I didn't really know that. It's like you're the second person in the past like week that's told me that the qualifiers are on Tuesday or Wednesday. So how does that work? Some people like it and some people don't. Um, no doubt it's better for television, just like, you know, tennis. Um, but the qualifiers on Tuesday or Wednesday is basically in order to have the start time earlier or less of a burden for most of the pros that want to get there on Friday or Saturday. So for example, they'll just put everybody on qualifiers on Wednesday and if you make it, then you'll play on Friday or Saturday. It depends on mixed or men's or whatever. Um, so then, like typically what they did before was they did qualifiers starting at like 7 a.m. So you'd have to get there at like six to warm up. And, and if you were lucky enough to qualify, then you'd start at like nine or 10. But uh, in order to basically free some time up um, they just put qualifiers a few days before, mm -hmm. which is certainly tough for, for most people. I mean, you know, the people in qualifiers are more likely to have a full-time job. <laughs> yeah. And so it's tough for them to take one day off on a Friday, more or less three to get there out on a Wednesday. So it's, it's certainly tough. I mean, you really have to commit or find some sort of sponsor or flexibility with your job. Yeah. It's, it's a good thing. The remote working like whole like thing happened the, that whole room that whole movement i think that kind of helps because so i think thomas wilson still has like a full-time job right yeah yeah i don't know how i mean yeah like we try to play sometimes and he's like you can't do this time can't do this time because he's got a call work call meeting and stuff like that so he, he he actually manages his time pretty well in order to make make both happen yeah that's crazy he's like a top five player probably yeah he's yeah like still has a full-time job yeah Oh, he's probably gonna have to keep it now that he has that baby. Yeah. <laughs> so what are you waiting for? Go to viori.com slash building pickleball. Not only will you receive 20% off your first purchase, but you'll also receive free shipping on any orders of $75 or more, as well as free returns. Enjoy the rest of the show. Man, I couldn't imagine being like, a, I guess like a full-time athlete during the time when I was in college. Granted, maybe times have changed or I was just not a great kid at around that time. <laughs> but like, how's that for you? Because not only are you, you know, like a full-time athlete, but you're also someone who, is planning on using your degree once you get out of college, which isn't always the case. Like for me, I major in like nutrition dietetics. I didn't follow the path where like I used my degree and you hear that's like a pretty common story. So like, how's that been for you? Mm -hmm. It's certainly been a nuisance in terms of time consumption, um, for sure. Especially when you have homework as well as tests to study for, and then you also have to practice and train and travel to tournaments. Um, the cool part is now, like compared to whatever, even say 10 years ago, online classes are more easy, easier to access. So I have a couple online classes, but there are a few core classes that you need to be in person for. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it certainly, it certainly is tough. Um, I would say, honestly, the people 
the people that do it mostly do it online. So for example, if you, I mean, you could look at a few of the pro players that were able to graduate. They do it for the most part online, um, which is super helpful. But uh, going to UT, like it goes to show how, how easy the goalposts can shift because like I moved to Austin in order to go to UT to go to the school of McCombs, which is a business school and then be a banker. And then whatever, three years, uh, MBA, and then work at a hedge fund or VC until I was 35 or whatever. And then pickleball just fell into my lap. And so decided to pursue it. And then now instead of going to the school of McCombs, I'm pursuing uh, an economics degree rather than finance. So I still think I can use that, which is cool. Um, balancing it has obviously been tough, but it just goes to show, I mean, two years ago, I was like set on finance, on being a banker. And now it's like, well, look at this. Pickleball is like, you can actually make a living off of it or, you know, just stuff like that. Where another cool part is it's so like the growth is already has and will be exponential. Is that it's like, for example, right now, like we're still, I mean, we're, we have a pretty decent amount of following, but imagine us in like five years where we were like more so like the pioneers or something like that. I mean, I think there's so much growth to be had in this and that's why I think investing in it is worth it and putting a bunch of time into it. Do you see like, is your vision for like the sport and like your prediction, obviously no one knows for certain, but like, do you see that this is going to be like a very like long-term thing and that it's not necessarily like a bubble that's going to be, that's going to burst anytime soon? In terms of the sports, other, r regardless of the leagues, because we've seen leagues in the past fail, we've seen what's going on right now. Also, uh, uh, progress has been hindered lately. <laughs> um, in terms of where it's headed, I think that there's progress may slow, but it's certainly not stopping or reversing. If you think about pickleball in general, like what we talked about before, it's so easy to play that it'll certainly garner more attention than tennis or and just saying on a, a local level, not, not on a pro level yet. Um, or anything like that because the court's so small, it's easy to get involved. It's relatively cheap for the most part if you just want to get a, a pack of two at Costco, you know. Um, and I mean, the adoption has been pretty rapid. And e even if it slows down, we're still at the beginning of the S curve. How do you think like paddles and paddle technology and that development? Like, I feel like there's a lot of excitement in the equipment. You can kind of see like in the reviewers, you see it at like the courts. Everyone's got like a different, mostly. A different like paddle for the most part how do you think like paddles once they kind of like once they plateau in technology how do you think like that'll affect the game honestly i think i think it'll be this is kind of a subtopic but i kind of think it will be good if technology plateaus because then it will basically everybody will be on an even playing field but i don't think that'll ever happen i think there will always be innovation take for example like f1 i mean granted they have the cost cap now but every year they're improving, and even if it's the mo even if even if it's the most minute of a change, it will have a 0.5 percent or you know one percent increase. And I think that that's what these paddle companies will tend to strive for. And then, even if it's not a big increase, say for example, like um, the aerodynamics of the little circle on the bottom of the paddle or something like that, um, it's like you can also just market it and push it like that. And even though it's a super small change. Um, I think they'll always be pushing for anything like that, even if it's like carbon fiber now or foam core is big now, um, two years from now, assuming um, USAPA like doesn't do anything to, you know, ruin paddle technology advancements. Um, there, there will be another one like that, you know, I mean, yeah. you've seen it in every sport, granted, uh, like tennis, uh, I think is a good example of technology slowing down, um, which I think will we could eventually get there, but like what we said, since it's such a young sport, we still have so much. Like people just discovered a foam core, I'm pretty sure. I don't think anybody in two years ago was knew that was a thing. Yeah, it's like that and like Kevlar is like a kind of a buzzword, if you will now, as, as Chris Olson would say. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, his name got dropped in another episode. I, I honestly, I honestly tried not to say his name. But I had to give credit because I just see picture that thumbnail. Yeah. Um, speaking of like USAP and paddles and like paddle technology, you're sponsored by ProXR. And they were like at, 
they were in like the headlines, I guess, I suppose for like one of the testing, testing results, but I don't think like anything actually happened, but do you have any insider information on this pro start releasing anything new for 2024? They have a bunch of cool stuff in the works. I like really like, especially with their acquisition of paddle tech in specific. Oh, they, acqu- um, they acquired paddle tech. Yeah. Yeah. So Damn. now they have paddle tech pro XR and boundless pickleball which each will tap into a different niche per se. So um, I think I think the acquisition was good, but in specific, Boundless Pickleball is, college pickleball is so ripe for a brand to, for a paddle company to just come in there and take up a majority of the market. I mean, if you think about it, not many big paddle brands are investing in college pickleball, and that's such an untapped niche that I think Boundless will tap into. So, for example, what they're doing is they're licensing um, college logos and then just putting them on paddles and then selling them at a relatively cheap markup. And so it tailors towards, you know, the typical college kid that just wants some patriotism towards his college. Um, You can see, I don't know if you've seen some of the UT boundless paddles as well. Um, But yeah, so they have them for Iowa, Arkansas, whatever, Michigan, UT. And I think it's perfect. I think that's where... I think Boundless is honestly perfectly positioned for college pickleball. And then take, for example, ProXR. They're the more high-end, um, more technologically advanced with their with their paddle face, with their paddle technology, um, and then selling it for, obviously, you know, on, on the higher end of prices. So I, I really like all the different avenues that ProXR is going to take, or that is taking, and that they're going to expand into in the future. So Pro XR is going to be manufacturing those boundless paddles. Or like, oh, okay, damn, that's sweet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know anything about that college side. I was, I came from like a very small school that was in like Southwest Virginia. It was like the coolest thing was like a Walmart. So like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about like college sports. Like, we didn't come up on that. We didn't even have like a D three football team. Like the biggest thing we had was actually like a rugby team. They had won like nationals, but. Um, how is that going as far as being on like the UT, the, like the Longhorns pickleball team? And like, I don't ever see you at Sark. I don't want to throw you under yeah. the bus. I don't see you with Zoya. I don't see you with Timmy and, and Alec. But um, I'm assuming like you guys all go to tournaments together. You guys play in events. Like, how does that look? What is, what can you kind of like share about like what the college pickleball experience is like? Yeah. So there's, I mean, there, there's a bunch of different paths to unpack just from that statement. But I mean, for the most part, all of, we have a competitive team as well as a, a social club and then like a competitive team broken off of it, um, which was a nuisance at first. Cause it's like, in order to use, in order to use the UT trademarks, such as the Longhorn logo, um, such as the Longhorn name, we had to, um, apply and become a sponsored student org through the school, which means that we couldn't take profits if we, um, if we went to a tournament or won anything like that. So we basically divided it into two, a social club and then a competitive club. That competitive club is like the, 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 the people there, like what we said, Zoya, Timmy, Alec, um, a few of the guys on the UT Pickle team are truly grinding because there is, there's actually a lot of money getting thrown into College Pickle right now. For example, um, APP had their tournament last year, or no, yeah, yeah, at the end of last year. And I think it had like 40 grand in prize money. Duper had 50 grand in prize money. So it's a lot. Like you can go there and for example, APP actually comped your housing there. So yeah, so, so they're investing a lot of money into it. So there's a reason why we're grinding and there's a reason why well, hopefully we're going to be the best team in college pickleball. Um, but yeah, we have team practices and stuff like that. Um, we're talking to um, a bunch of places. So for example, the lab, on a, in the East Side, um, East Side Paddle Club, uh, Austin Pickle Ranch, a bunch of these places, and I'm trying to collaborate with them in order to have our team play there, um, and just have set up practices for our competitive team. But uh, it's it's certainly fun. I mean, it's just kind of like a club, um, kind of like club travel team. So it's fun, and then hopefully we're able to make some money as well, rather than just throwing you know throwing five grand or ten grand into a money or into a, a money fire, you know. So. I also think getting sponsors is going to be big. So in order to help pay for that uh, fundraising, there's different ways to fundraise, like whatever, just revenue split or, you know, gra- sim- simply grab a sponsor or stuff like that. But uh, there, there's a lot that 
nobody's ever done because college pickle is relatively new. Yeah. Are you spearheading like some of that, like the management and the organization and like just the way you've kind of talked about that? It, like, it just sounds like you're the one kind of behind the scenes on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we have a whole team of like 15 people behind it. Oh, we have okay. a, we have a media team, like a social media team. We have a, a team for the social side as well as the competitive side. So like I help run the competitive side, mm. uh, the competitive side. And then we have uh, a co-founder of mine who runs like the, the more social side of things. For example, Ali, Timmy or uh, Alec, Timmy and Zoya, they, they also are as important as me in putting together practice times yeah. and helping to find sponsors and reach out to sponsors. Um, I just simply provide a bigger name. Like uh, that's, okay. yeah. I mean, yeah. So they're working as hard as I am for this stuff. Yeah. Um, Timmy does a great job on that rec scene and you can tell he's like trying to put in the work for someone who doesn't have like a racket sports background. Um, yeah, looks, looks great. And he's always like, he actually is like very positive out there. Yeah. He, yeah. Like, gives sure. a good like image. Mm hmm. And so this year we have a, we have a bunch of tournaments lined up. Duper's trying to put together like regional tournaments and they're actually trying to incentivize colleges to host tournaments on their courts. So for example, Baylor, Baylor's hosting a tournament. Um, A&M is going to host a tournament. Uh, we're hoping to also host a tournament and then Duper will help, uh, hopefully help, uh, comp some housing as well as offer up some prize money and stuff like that, just to get local colleges near the area competing. And, you know, it'll go into Duper and stuff like that, which is annoying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, are we, okay. we going to get into that too? <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, so, so it'll be fun. I'm hoping to play um, a bunch of college tournaments. Um, unfortunately, like at the end, at the later half of last year, it was annoying just because the college tournaments were the same weekend as other tournaments, which I already committed to. So I wasn't able to show up to the college tournaments, but this year... I'm definitely committed to playing a bunch of the college tournaments. I was wondering about that. I was like, how come we don't see like Jack more on like that side? And I just didn't think it was like, I was like, um, I just didn't assume that it was a scheduling, but that makes sense. I didn't know if it was maybe like a contract thing or yeah, just assumed or in some ways like a skill level thing. Like, like how do you stand against other collegiate players? What's, I mean... Uh, a typical, like a good rule of thumb on the college level is if you have one good player, you'll win, you'll win at least 50% of your matches. Oh, wow. So all you need is one other decent player to win another match and you're good. So, um, so for example, like Colin Schick, he'll win both of his matches and then in a, in a dream breaker, he will run through the other guy. So all he needs is another, another woman's dub, another mixed dub. Um, and then that'll give it the three, one, assuming you're playing like the MLP format where yeah. it's. Um, two mixed men's and then women's. Um, so for example, but if you have two good girls, so for example, TCU has two really good girls, um, then you have the opportunity to win three matches because you have each girl playing a mixed match and then you have the women's match. So if you have one good guy, then you're likely to win both your matches, but then it could go into a dream breaker. So for example, like Timmy or Zoya, um, if imagine like if we have an entire team of four, five, five O's, like we're gonna we're gonna run through everybody. Um, so I think, I mean that's a pretty good rule of thumb. How do college kids perceive pickleball? Like you're around a lot of college kids, and then they probably it probably comes up in conversation, right? They're like, oh, like what do you do besides like majoring in econ and doing business stuff? You're probably like, I'm a professional pickleball player. They're like what the f is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're so bamboozled by it. It's, oh, really? it's nuts. So, I mean, originally, like I tell people, like I just travel and play competitively, but then, um, you know, a few of them like just follow me on Instagram and they're like, yo, like you're actually a pro. Um, but in, in terms of how pickleball is viewed, the kids love it. Like oh, it's so huge. I mean, you can tell by the turnout in Eastside Paddle, I mean, you have college kids showing up there. You have college kids showing up at the ranch. These kids love it. And so when we host our events, our first event, we did a decent job marketing it. But keep in mind, it was a free event. And we had 100 people show up at Austin Pickle Ranch, which was nine courts or eight, eight courts, yeah. um, which is absurd because that means it's eight times four. Uh, what, 32? Yeah. Yeah, 32. <laughs> <laughs> You're 32, asking the wrong so, guy. Yeah, 32 people on courts and then 60 people waiting. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it's absurd and people just go out, have a good time. We had, 
we had like 30 novices go out and some of them, I mean, honestly, most of those novices came alone, which is ballsy in the first place. And so we, I mean, they just had a blast. They, they met new friends. They, you know, I, I tried my best to run a little clinic just to teach them the rules and stuff like that. And they just, they love it because it's, once again, it's an easy sport um, to get the hold of other than the scoring. The scoring's freaking difficult. <laughs> um, but yeah, they love it. I mean, truly, they'll go out and play for fun. And you can see more college kids picking it up. I mean, at our courts, we have uh, on campus, we have like basketball courts with pickleball courts lined. Mm -hmm. And you can book basketball or pickleball. And if you look at the website for bookings, it's all pickleball. It's like, I mean, every single court is just pickleballed out after 6 p.m. Is this outdoor basketball courts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Which I feel bad because, I mean, you know, like a basketball court could hold arguably more people than two pickleball courts on a basketball court. But, I mean, you could just show like there's just such a wave of students that just love it. I mean, like they'll put together the net, they'll just play music, and it's just a good activity. Keep in mind, I said activity, not sport. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, it's a, great way. yeah. <laughs> it's a great way for everybody to just, you know, go out and also burn some cal calories, be active, stuff like that. That's so true. Like, I feel like, so I don't want to try and, I don't want to age myself here, but back when I was in college, like drinking was very, like, uh, it's just very like embedded into the college experience. But now like from what I've noticed is like college kids now have kind of like gone or moved away from that direction and they're just finding other ways to like have fun. There's the way you're talking about like, okay, like you have kids like setting up a pickleball net, then they like blast music and they just like have a good time. Not to say that they aren't drinking, but yeah, it's a great way to just like socialize and have fun without the use of like alcohol, um, which can sometimes just, inherently like bring along with it like some trouble and stuff so you just like steer clear of all of that and then just find a way to have fun but also being a d1 or like on track to be a professional athlete in tennis baseball basketball or any of those traditional sports like incredibly difficult not to say that pickleball isn't difficult but i feel like it's an opportunity for some of those kids who may have been like high school athletes and then got burned out and then they like find their way and like, oh man, like this pickleball thing's so fun. And they're still like athletic. They still have like that mental sharpness too. So that's super cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And literally just going outside for two hours with your friends, blasting music and breathing fresh air is like, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying like this is what happens, but if you're a parent, you're so happy that they found pickleball. You know, I mean, it's like one of the best things. I mean, I've seen it change you, you and I, as well as likely most of the viewers have seen it change someone's life. You've seen them either get out of a dark hole that they were in. You've seen them lose weight and become a bit more active. I mean, there's so many different ways it can change your life. And whether you're a college student or a bit older, I mean, it's certainly a benefit. And less screen time, which I think is everyone can kind of agree that the whole screen thing and social media apps has been very like dangerous to, uh, especially like young and developing like individuals. But you, when you talked about like, it could be so beneficial to like for people who might be experiencing something tough that kind of reminded me, I don't know if you're friends with her, but she's in the APP side. Someone had mentioned her name before his name is like Riley Bonhart Bonhart. Yeah. I remember she, her story is kind of like she had battled with like suicide and she, uh, found pickleball and it just like speaking of something that saved her life like the pickleball did that for her and it's not even just applies to young people like there's old people too like you know a lot of people just kind of give up on life like after a certain age they just become like they just kind of think that okay like I, I'm, I've like had my kids I've like had my career now I could just like coast and like they don't find something new to like reinvigorate their life and I think that pickleball has done a great job of that mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is why the adoption's been so rapid, because it, it's not really held down by a specific age group. You could play it when you're 15, which is what I see um, pretty often. Like you, even at least back in Cali, um, you, you you could see a bunch of high school kids just go out and play there, and you know like whether it's girls or guys or they're mixing, and then you could also go to the next court over, and then there's like literally 60 years old, 60 years old uh, people just playing, still having the time of their life, still having like good games. And what's gnarly is at points like they can intermingle, which is 
just mind boggling. Because if you think about it in terms of basketball or if you're going to play baseball or softball, if you're a bit older or any, anything like that, it's, it's so tough to intermingle different age groups. And pickleball is one of the rare sports that can. Yeah, you can't write people off based on their age, their weight, their gender, or like their size in pickleball. Like you just can't make that assumption. They could easily just mop the floor with you. Like they could just crush you. That's, yeah, that's so interesting. I know. We, I'm, we, we've both been spanked by Sally <laughs> before. Like, I mean, you walk on the court and you think it's a freaking like walk in the park and then, you know, you just get absolutely it's, whooped. That's why I don't go to McMaster's anymore <laughs> in Georgetown. <laughs> Last year, I don't know how many people like knew about you, but I like, I, I think you were like pretty low key. And then you had that game at the, the match at the nationals, which like that helped like propel, like bring your stock up. And then you also, you also had like clips of, uh, you like practicing with Ben, but basically what I'm getting at is like that match, the Roscoe John's match, um, turned out to be 11, four, 11, zero, 11, 13. And then, uh, I think like 11, six on the fourth game, what was going through your mind after game two? So, I mean, that, that game in specific, or that match in specific was honestly, I believe a pretty good, um, I think most top players watch that match over and over because there's so much nuance out of that match that Roscoe and I brought to the table that, I mean, you, you even see Dane Gindrick, uh, Gingrich at points, like he posts that match over and over about like what, what happened in this specific point or stuff like that. So it's honestly a pretty good, um, outline for a different approach to beat, obviously, the GOATs. Um, in terms of what was going on in my mind after match two, it was just certainly getting the nerves out. Because, you know, like being on a stage like that obviously takes a little bit of time. Um, getting the nerves out, being confident in hitting your shots because there's points where we held back. And, you know, like you have a strategy, but then you have an opportunity to um, to actually do that strategy and then it's like oh maybe but I'm a little tight so I'm gonna just hit a dink back or something like that um so it was like we were fully loose after that match we were like we literally lost 11-0 we couldn't be anything worse <laughs> like you know um so yeah it was it was basically just looking at each other and being like like literally just play your game just play your game and being confident in that and it's tough to it's tough to have confidence after getting spanked for sure but it also gives you, um, it gives you, it makes you a little bit more loose because you have nothing to lose. And going into that match, we also had nothing to lose because they're the number one team. They've been the number one team for years on end. Um, but that's, I'd say that's what changed after game three. We used a pretty, a pretty nuanced strategy compared to most, uh, matchups against the Johns brothers. And it seemed to pay off assuming that we made our balls. Um, I think that one of the things, honestly, w w without going like too deep into it, um, I do think that what we did really well was applying pressure through being aggressive, as well as having a lefty is huge, and then a lefty with a tui, because name one other top pro who's a lefty who has a tui, like you got Pablo Tellez, you got Rafa Hewitt, um, like there's not many looks that the Johns brothers have that where they have an aggressive right side lefty um so so that was a matchup that we wanted for sure and then roscoe being long um roscoe being strong as well um honestly Ro roscoe did roscoe did his job extremely well and that's why we won that game because obviously you could rewatch that game and see he was hitting amazing serves amazing drives which allowed me to come in there and basically just create chaos at the net by poaching or speeding up a high dink or anything like that and we changed the pace created chaos controlled chaos which is what you should want to do um rather than chaos you can still win with chaos um but yeah, that was that was what allowed us to win that game, sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah, like an 11-4, 11 11 which the score really doesn't say much. I, I feel like you may have you guys may have just like scored on the wrong points, but also like there's like I could see the Johns had to have like come even with an 11-0, they had to have come away from that game being like, okay, we picked up this, we picked up that. Like they had to have like gotten so much out of even just like an 11-0 game. But yeah, when I saw y'all in the 11-13 
game you definitely seemed more loose like you were poaching more attacking more it's crazy to see like you guys attacking two-handed backhands from the outside in um that was that was working a lot um the exchanges it just seemed like some it seemed like you guys were just losing some of those like exchanges too just by like unforced errors but then you guys like also started to read like oh if he like if ben's going through the exchange and it's like the third or like fifth ball in the exchange, just move out of the way and the ball's just going to sail, um, which doesn't happen often, but you guys read it. Something I noticed was like they kept attacking Roscoe's right, which was also like your left hand when you were on the right, Roscoe was on the left. How come that opening was there? Like they kept attacking his like right hip. It's certainly tough because in that spot, like what created it was likely a high dink. So it was likely my fault in which I hit a high dink. Um, cross court and then I'm supposed to slide and cover everything ex everything from probably half a foot out to his right hip extended to the right if that makes sense so he covers he covers line body and then his right hip and then I cover middle um, with that it just took a little bit of time in order to figure that out because you know just just like with everything I mean you're like you know your job but it's different when you're applying it so I mean, just a little miscommunications there. And obviously playing Ben and Colin, it's like there's no room to miscommunicate. There's zero room to kind of be like, is this your ball or is this my ball or anything like that? So we, we struggled a bit for a second there, committing or not committing. Um, but now obviously with reps, it's it's a pretty defined role on which which ball is ours and which ball or which ball's his, which ball's mine, stuff like that. Yeah. And it's also one of the perks why you have a lefty because then – someone can sit body and the other person can cover middle whether it's me covering line and body and then roscoe sitting middle with his forehand or roscoe covering line and body and then i'm sitting with middle with my forehand so it's one of the biggest advantages you could have in pickleball yeah that was going to be one of my next questions was like what are the advantages but you already went over that um and then speaking of you and this wasn't like the first time you and roscoe had played together on i guess in a way that was published on YouTube in like a, in somewhat like a big way, which is like the other match was like the Kappa. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that one, that one was super cool to watch. I think, yeah. Um, those, that one was super cool. It was, I don't know who the other two guys are. It's like Jericho and Dave Jericho. And his name was Hugo Hugo. Yeah. The final, what was the final score of that one? It's like 59 59 like that yeah so if anyone watching this like definitely check that one out that one's like awesome <laughs> it was like a there's so much attacking <laughs> there's so much attacking. you're like there's got to be something happening here um there's like so much attacking in that one which was it was just super exciting but then there was also like a someone called it out in the comments it was at like minute 21 or 22 there was like some beef that had started over like a bad call and multiple people were on y'all side as far as the call but someone called it out in the comics was just, comments was just like how you pulled back from your like i guess like nowadays people call it your bark or your like your snapback on that person and where did where does that come from like because you initially got in like a verbal altercation and then you're like you know what i'm just gonna stay out of it and you just like you actually i believe you apologized Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that, um, honestly, I've like we could have an entire different podcast talking about this. But um, one of the things in terms of dealing with trash talk or altercations in general is that the people that do it likely thrive off of it. So you're just going to put oil in the fire if you talk back. So it's simply shutting it down, brushing it off being a bit more stoic with it. Um, back where we left off, we're talking about the stoicism in that like moment. Man, that doesn't, uh, even like as an adult now, I'm like 35 years old, like back when I was your age. How old are you, by the way? I'm 15. 15? <laughs> no, kid, I'm 19. <laughs> <laughs> your face was so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i was like dude this kid he's like benjamin button he like reversed um yeah i mean man at like that age i i would have just like lost my cool i would have just played along with it and just like snapped back um yeah it's one of the perks of 
something that basketball taught me because you know in basketball there's just a bunch a bunch of smack talking back and forth and the people who smack talk if you add fuel to the fire keep smack talking back it likely pushes them to play better so one of the best things to do is without like putting your head down and conceding just basically they're firing shots at you and it, you're just like deflecting them like it, it doesn't matter to you you could do that through many ways for example one way being stoicism like just simply not letting it get to you just understand like hey breathe focus breathing which is a big part as well take deep breaths um Djokovic actually has um he, he does that and he's who taught me that where it's like it doesn't matter it's the ball and I'm just going to stare at the ground and breathe and breathe and breathe so something like that um, really helps or something which I love to do in basketball just because I found it funny but it genuinely works is sarcasm I found that sarcasm is like a win-win if you use it because it's like you're terrible at the game and then you're just like maybe like you're right and it's like but then like what how are they supposed to react they're like oh shit he's right <laughs> like, like like you know like I just found that sarcasm works works really well um, in terms of diffusing conversations or just like it kind of like dazes and confuses the other person um, so, so so yeah like they speed a ball up and like you and you you put it away and then they're like oh my god he's not there and you're like yeah do it again like yeah no you're right you're right like just it, it's not like you're backing down it's just like it's just like using sarcasm and they're just so confused on what to do next because it's like you're not shit talking back yeah but you're also not, you're not really letting it affect you. You're yeah. just basically saying something. It's like an eight mile when Eminem like made fun of himself and then the guy couldn't say anything because he just took yes. all the words right out of his mouth. Yes, yes. That's interesting because you didn't let it affect your performance, which like doesn't matter what age you are. Like if anyone does like tosses like something like that at you, it can very easily just like throw you off and you didn't let it affect your performance at all. You and Roscoe just continue to do exactly what you're doing and, you know, like close that out with that gold medal match. And that's sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's definitely, I've taken many different approaches to it, um, over time. And I found that that both at least the partially stoic and partially sarcastic, and then also depending when to use them, but, um, are the two best ways to, um, not let anybody get under your skin. Damn, that's interesting. Like, there's definitely something like so many people could take away from that. Because even if like people watch your content too, like your content is so loose and fun, and it almost like bleeds into the way you play too. You're like incredibly loose, especially for someone who doesn't have a racket sports background. Like, you're making stuff up on the fly and you're also like having a really good time you're very like light out there um yeah it's interesting yeah and it's also one of the better ways to respond to to respond to hate hit on social media as well because like for example like if you're posting pickleball stuff eventually if you get big enough tennis players are going to start commenting and most of the tennis players are negative for the most part and so it's like you know they're like oh my god pickleball is so easy or oh my god like it's only for grandmas they're like Oh my God, I could play this. I could play this and be the top pro. And I'm like, shit, he has a point. Like, hey guys, he's right. Like, you know, like that's, that's just how I comment back. And it's like, like now, now how are they supposed to respond? You know, cause, cause they know you're being sarcastic. So they're like, ha, got him. Like, no, they're, they're not going to do that. So it's, it's, it, it applies virtually as well. They, they almost like don't even know what to say. They're mm -hmm. like, well, I can't be more. I can't be angrier at him because now he's being funny. It's like you almost start laughing and yeah. you're like, oh, now I like, now this could, is actually turn out to be kind of cool. Okay. Um, speaking of like mentality. So that's like your during game mentality. That's like facing adversity during a game. Not that that's like the most intense adversity anyone could experience, but you know, that does come into play when you're doing your professional career. But like, how do you prep for tournaments? Do you go through like a routine, a ritual? Do you like do visualization? What is, you know, like your week look like le leading up to a tournament? So one of the big things that I took away, which is a, it's not even anything big. It's just something that you should do is drink as much water as you can, like two to three days before. Cause I mean, I've struggled with like dehydration at points or cramping or something like that. And if you basically, if you drink ahead of time, 
it will really help with that. So I try my best to like actually drink a bit more than I typically do. Um, those days coming up, obviously I carbo load the night before or something like that just for energy. Um, in terms of true like mental mechanics, I watch as much film as possible. Um, typically like there's not, there's not enough film on like everybody that you're going to play first round, second round, and you don't know until the night before. It's just watching film of myself in the past or just watching Ben Johns and Colin play, um, or something like that, just to get, just to understand, just to understand the patterns, um, kind of get used to even the crowd, even if you're literally a spectator watching it on YouTube or something like that, just immerse, uh, just being immersive, um, one way or the other, just watching pickleball. Um, music's big. I think music's one of the most important things in life in general. Um, Spotify recaps that I listen to music like 17% of my life for the year. Yeah. So like music's big. Music can alter your mood as well. So I highly recommend that music is like a very beneficial way to boost or to do whatever you're going to do better, assuming that you use it right. So... Um, I'd highly recommend a good pair of headphones and a Spotify subscription or something like that in order to play, whether it's chill music, hype music, or just simply background music when you're studying or something like that. What was, what was on your like Spotify re, re your rap for like the top five artists? It's, it's all over the place. Like there's some Tiesto or like loud luxury. And then there's like Jack Harlow. Um, and then a few more like niche, uh, niche, uh, kind of like house people yeah yeah damn. Mm-hmm. so no taylor swift no t swift yeah <laughs> have you heard jack's song D- denver no but i've heard of the name it's on I his like it's newer so. album that's with like the the main song is like they don't they don't love it yeah that yeah, song's yeah. that's a good song. also yeah yeah uh, yeah he's, cool. he's a cool dude <laughs> yeah, i wasn't yeah. always like into him but i like slowly got into him i was mm-hmm. like damn it's cool yeah any other rituals? Well, actually, what do you eat before leading up to a tournament? That's actually really important. Honestly, typically just, I'm, I'm fine having like a bunch of carbs just because like, that's just honestly, like what I talked about in the newsletter, maybe a little bit of a placebo where it's like, I think I'm, I'm eating right. So therefore my mind is going to think I'm eating right. Um, but I have like just pasta and chicken or something like that. Enough, enough carbs where I'm not absolutely drained um but yeah that's big it's just once again all these rituals habits superstitions whatever whatever you think it is i just highly recommend getting like two or three in order for your mind to then start getting used to them and then your mind will just subconsciously get in the right place before every tournament yeah that's great man like it allows your mind to like come back to a familiar state yeah yeah um it's funny when you talk about these like rituals, I had a, like a training partner. He was like a guy who took me under his wing when I was fighting. He was like a very successful pro fighter. And like one of his rituals was like leading up to a fight, like two weeks before your fight, you have like your weight cut. You're pretty much done doing like any hard sparring right now. You're just focused on like cutting weight. And he, for the last week leading up to the fight would not take a shower. So you're talking about this guy would go <laughs> into a sauna sweat like (laughs) 10 to 12 pounds out leading up to the fight and would not take a shower from that and like he would wear the same shorts and the same like boxers that he wore in the last day of the sauna so and he just said like when opponents would like go up to him and stuff he he just had this like stench and he's just like it just messes with people and yeah yeah, some people just have like those interesting things um Mm -hmm. yeah getting getting in the way of your opponent's mindset it's kind of like a gray area because it's like are you allowed to do certain things that aren't even like they're they're kind of morally wrong in a way so say for example like like what medvedev does in tennis where he like uses the bathroom even though he doesn't need to use his bathroom as like evidence on break point or something like that for example you could take even even some people in pickleball who just want a change in rhythm so like they'll there's honestly people that have done this they, the ref like needs to see blood in order to call a medical timeout. So they scrape their skin on the ground in order to show them blood or just something like that in order to change the rhythm 
or anything like that. It's it's a gray area because it's like you should just play. You should just play and the better man wins or there's mind games and you can try to tap into the other person by untying your shoe and then trying to tie your shoe just so now they're kind of out of their typical rhythm or something like that. If you ain't cheating, you're not trying. <laughs> <laughs> it's like if when you play and you're in like a gold medal match, you're like you just you're playing singles or something and you this guy is in a rhythm hitting like four or five passing shots and assuming yeah. you don't have any timeouts left would you uh, pull some shady shit? <laughs> absolutely do anything to ice the kicker like they've done they've done the studies on that stuff right like i put out a video on like choking under performance and like that was one of the things that you could do you could also just like I don't know how often this one works and especially if you're at like a high caliber, high tier like level, but you could, if the guy's performing great, like, dude, that's like such an amazing forehand. Like, how did you hit that? Yeah. Can you show me later? <laughs> and then he's just like getting in his own head about it. But there's also people that probably like Ben, who's just like a, it's like a steel vault. Like those guys, they, mm -hmm. they aren't there just because of their technical, like prowess or just skill it's like their ability to just stay cool under pressure mm -hmm. it's like no real emotion shown externally and if it's not shown externally then you know that pretty internally they're probably keeping it pretty dialed mm -hmm. yeah ben is one of the people that i kind of aspired to be like when i started playing out in terms of how he handled himself yeah like whether whether he won or point or not assuming that there wasn't like a bunch of energy behind the point he would typically have the same stoicism when you walk back to the baseline which is big because for example if someone's trying to play mind games with you and they're like oh my god that's such a great serve or like oh my god don't miss this serve or like don't miss it long or like do you breathe in or out when you serve or something like that it's like it just it just deflects it literally just deflects because they're staring at the ground they're like i'm gonna hit this ball like they're focused on the ball rather than the outside conditions and ben was one of the original ones that taught me how to just basically lock into a game like what you said a steel vault yeah and it's interesting because like if you can lock that in during a game that can easily bleed over into your life which is also like really important like you don't want to take criticism or praise seriously it's like what most people who i guess that's maybe it's like a like thought leaders will say right like just treat them both fairly like you don't want to get into your too get into your head too much or like get into your ego about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I remember talking with Colin. It was at the Yola Media launch day. I, I recorded it. It was supposed to be like released on YouTube, but for some reason, all I had was a shotgun mic, so <laughs> you couldn't hear either of us. But I remember asking him about that. I was like, when we when people watch you play, you guys just have this like super calm demeanor, and you just that's exactly what he talked about, right? He's like. He doesn't only treat the game like that. He treats his opponents like that, maybe with the exception of Julian Arnold. Yeah. But, um, yeah, he, they just treat, try to treat everyone with, like, sportsmanship. That's mm -hmm. pretty much what Colin said. He's yeah. like, sportsmanship is the most important thing. That's how we were raised. And, like, I, you've probably met Hannah, and you've probably, like, hung out with her. Like, she's... She's actually like what somewhat different because she's like very high energy. But then when I'm sure like in a competitive saying very sportsmanship minded, mm -hmm. sportsman like minded. But like, yeah, it's just very yeah. like even baseline. I'm going to drop a bombshell. Are you ready for this? <laughs> 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 so um, one of the things that kind of carved me out to be the person that I am today is um, which I haven't told anyone this yet, at least in the pickle space, only a few people know this, um, that really helped me handle my emotions uh, outside of, or just in life in general, is I got hooked on to day trading in high school. And I was playing, um, not, not I was playing, I got hooked onto the trend. It was kind of a bad trend because, you know, day trading was a big thing. And I did uh, virtual tours. So on Zillow and stuff, you see the virtual tours, you can click through the house and stuff like that. I started one of those with my friend and so then we charged whatever like 15 cents a square foot or 25 cents a square foot or something like that and then went to a bunch of these and then I used that money to help finance my day trading and I thought it was super cool I wanted to do it and obviously that's what sparked my interest in finance in general but one of the most important takeaways with that is learning human psychology and how to handle and compose your emotions because in that case whether you're swinging or just truly day trading you can wake up or you can blink and you're down 15 percent, and you're like oh shit like i need to sell i need to sell like i need to get out of this it's gonna it's only gonna get worse and you could you could see your mind in the gears 
shift towards that negative um, kind of psychology. And then same when you're up, when in reality you should have a set plan, um, a set way to handle yourself. And so I did that for three, four years through high school and it truly taught me how to compose myself, not only for day trading, but also for everything outside of high school, or for everything outside of that. So for life, for basketball, for stuff like that, for stuff like this, it's like literally whether it's like sleep on it or whether it's just like take a few deep breaths and then compose yourself, it teaches you a lot about human psychology and handling your emotions. Damn. Were you into GameStop? <laughs> I was not. I was not. I was into uh, my big hit was Nvidia. Nvidia. Oh damn. Uh, the GPU chips. Yeah. If you're still holding, that's still good. Yeah. Damn. So that that was a big one. But then you know, like there's there was a bunch of flops because it's so hit or miss. I mean, back then, like um, since it was day trading, it was. I mean, I tried I tried to use my profits to like invest long term, but you know, day trading you you would you would touch anything even if it was like pennies. Damn, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah I never so, got into that. Yeah, so I mean, I don't recommend it. It's a like it's a bad thing to kind of get hooked on, so mm -hmm. I'm glad that I stopped and just started investing long term. But in terms of in terms of learning how to handle yourself, it doesn't get much more difficult than that. In terms of waking up and being like, "Oh, my options down a grand today." Or literally something like that. I mean, overnight you could see you just put 500 bucks into something and now it's worth 30. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, I was dealing with options. Yeah. Um, so that was huge for me. It kind of made me mature, I would say, way faster. And it streamlined my maturity by even four years or so. Absolutely, man. Like, you're dealing with money. I think there's only, like, so many so many things that are, like, just foundational to life. I think it's, like, money, love. Like, that's why I think, like, bad breakups are really good. But also, like, being in good relationships will teach you a lot about emotional regulation but also like yeah money i mean damn that's crazy mm -hmm. yeah so i've i've never told anybody in the pickle <laughs> realm that i don't think anyone knows that other than the people who were in high school with me as well as my parents so damn. Yeah. yeah in the end did you come out net positive i have i still have the account to this day because i like just let everything go and just open a new account because I didn't want to see that account. So I started investing long term, but I looked at the count, no joke, like three weeks ago after not looking at it for like two years. And I was up 3% all time, which is, you know, technically in the negatives due to inflation or whatever. But I, I was at one point, I'll, I'll just say the percentage. Oh, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> I was at one point down 42%. Yeah. But then I was also one, at one point up like 30%, oh, which, which damn. is, which is absurd. I mean, like if you look at the graph, it's just, <laughs> dude, that's when the addict says, dude, if you, you just, dude, if you just look at the graph. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, thankfully I made it out the mud positive. Yeah. Um, and damn. now, now I'm just fully investing long term. Um, so yeah, that's good. Man, aside from just like the emotional regulation, like lesson there, it's like also in finances, how many people are well versed in their own finances, let alone like at my age, older, let alone at the age of 19, like that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. And I owe it all to my, I owe it all to my dad for sure. And specific. I mean, he, he. I mean, originally when I got interested in stocks, like, you know, he'd work from whatever, eight to eight to six, and then he'd come home and, you know, the one thing he wants to do is shower and go watch a movie. And then I, I come there and I'm like, oh my God, what is this? Like, what's a 52 week high? What's a beta? What's like all this stuff? And then he'd like sit down and teach me it until like 11 at night. And, you know, like, you know, deep down, he just wants to go to bed. But I mean, I owe it to him for teaching me all the basics. And then every day I'd go on Investopedia and learn about different things and then always shoot him texts throughout the day or stuff like that. And then he'd be like, let's talk about it tonight. So he facilitated that for sure. So the end goal, one of my whys, if, if you wanted to get into it was, um, my dad's favorite car is a Ford GT. So the end goal is to buy him Ford GT. How much are those? Uh, they were 500 grand starting out, but now they're like 2 million. Oh, they went up. That must have been limited production. Yeah, yeah. 
They are. And, uh, I mean, more realistically, you could probably get one with a few miles on it for like 1.3. Yeah. Or something like that. But yeah. What's your dad like? Um, he was actually not the, um, what do you call it? One parent is, I'm blanking on the word. Um, one of them's like the, the harsher, like lay the, put the, put the hand down. Then the other one's like more, I'm blanking, bro. (laughs) I'm blanking too, but I know Um, what you mean. There's like, I guess you could say like good cop, bad cop, but there's one yeah, like yeah, yeah. who's like an enforcer and the other one who's like more, a lo- little more passive. Yeah. Yeah. So dad was more passive and easygoing and, uh, definitely not a shot against my mom because my mom taught me a lot about compassion in general or just when to put up with stuff and when to not. Um, but in specific, in this scenario, my dad was easygoing and he helped me get through a bunch of stuff and, you know, being the more easygoing parent, it's like, I'm more likely to go to you for stuff. Um, or stuff like that that's going on in my life and you know him having a a bunch of interest in investing in his kid granted that's like pretty obvious (laughs) but you know like some some parents still you know like they want their kid to succeed to succeed but only in the realm of what they want them to do Um, he truly had no no aspect in that he just wanted me to learn more about what I was interested about so that's why dude that's like like what more could you ask for in a parent, like a parent that just like guides you and helps you in what you want to pursue, but doesn't try to like force you in the direction that of things they may have failed or they may have missed, but they just support you in whatever you want to do. It could be anything. Well, hopefully not drugs, but like <laughs> not you, but just in general and they'll just support you. Like, that's awesome. Like mm-hmm. they're just by you instead of like being someone like in front of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're both huge fans of Alex Ramosi. One of the things that he said on one of his podcasts was one of the biggest things, um, that helped him succeed in life was just pure luck. As in like, he grew up with a pretty good family. He grew up with his parents. He grew up with, um, a bunch of stuff that obviously you should be grateful for. And some people just off the bat are starting with a disadvantage. So I'm definitely lucky to be put in, you know, there, there's a household roof under the uh, roof over our head and parents that are willing to invest in their kid. So, um, definitely, definitely lucky off the bat. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think I think about that all the time. Like we're one born in like a, uh, first world country, like two, we're like we're not born into poverty either. Like not bad and like, and not born in like bad circumstances either. But yeah, his, uh, his story is pretty interesting with like his dad. Mm-hmm. He always talks about how he like the, the best thing he could have ever done was like actually rebelling against what his dad wanted, which was like, actually goes back to what we were just talking about is like your dad just supported you like Hormozy, the way he talks about his dad, his dad only wanted him to go in like the direction that he wanted. And then Hormozy just decided to kind of sever that relationship by doing his own thing. But I guess like he got to kind of like get back around with his dad. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've seen that first firsthand with my best friend. It's my best friend. Um, you know, parents wanted him to do something else and he kind of similar broke off some ties and now he's like, you know, hyper successful for his age. And it's, you know, just, just like what happened with Alex comes full circle. They're all cool now. And, I mean, it goes to show, I mean, it, I mean, Alex kind of paved the way for even his, his name's Adrian for Adrian in a, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough because you miss all that time out, all that time that like, it's somewhat like arguably like very crucial time for like the development of that child. And then you kind of miss out on it because you're not willing to let your kid just take the direction that they know, even though usually parents do like know what's best, but it's all contextual, right? Like they're growing up in a different time, different circumstances to a degree. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. Speaking of like your Twitter, which shows some of like Hormozy's quotes and phrases, but also like Elon, you've definitely posted about like Patrick Bet David. What have you learned from someone like Elon? There's honestly, it's, it's, it's similar in every aspect of life in which you know a bunch of these people and you kind of want to take away like just their strengths from everybody. So for example, in Alex's case, as we just talked about, um, the ability to literally move across the country with nothing, sleep on a gym floor 
and just know that there's only one way to succeed and it's not failing. <laughs> um, but in, term, in terms of Elon, it's got to be something towards innovation. I mean, especially in pickleball. There is so, we could talk about it. Um, we could have like a think tank, <laughs> um, but there are so many untapped niches in pickleball in which people will, as soon as you start it, they'll initially hate and then they'll get more and more on board. And then once you succeed, then they're like, oh, I was there since day one. There are so many different ways that people can start companies in pickleball, even if you think it's saturated in terms of paddles, even if you think it's saturated in terms of um, courts or anything like that. There are so many different ways to innovate pickleball right now. And I mean, I, I, I'm hoping to do something like that as well in the future, not just, you know, put up the next uh, the next third shot drop video <laughs> yeah. or something like that, even though it'll perform really well. Um, but yeah, doing reaching a bit more for the stars and mm. there's so many different avenues for that. Do you have any announcements you want to make or do you just want to keep that under wraps for now? Uh, right now, it's just an idea. So okay. yeah, yeah. I, I don't even have a true pro forma yet or anything like that. Yeah, that's a good point, man. Like you can look at the videos that perform really well and we're both in the content side. So like we can relate to this, but like you see the videos that perform really well and you're like, oh, well, why don't I just do that? But then like, not only will you maybe not even get the same views, but you might, but you're also like spending that time to copy something instead of doing something original on to you. That's like authentic to you. And then like, it's so hard because you just see the views, but then it's like if you just pursue your own thing and you do it long enough, then the views will accumulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look and at th that's dude perfect. proven. <laughs> who? Look at dude perfect. Oh, really? You know? Yeah. Like I mean, who who wanted to watch backyard trick shots? And now look at them in Dallas with this huge warehouse. Yeah. You know? Um. But yeah, I was gonna say even uh, like something that you did. Well, well, one. I remember you told me how you posted every single day in all of 2023, right? Yep. What was like? your initial goal going into that? And like, what did you pick, get out of it afterwards? Honestly, the initial goal, some of it being ambition for money or some sort of uh, recognition in the social media space. But honestly, it was just, it was just the fact that there are so, there are not so many yet, but there are a bunch of pros in pickleball and less than 30% of them have a true brand which is honestly really sad to think about because I mean, you have like, you're a pro, you have a platform and you're not utilizing it at all. That's like one of the things is there's so much, like what we just talked about with niches, there's so many untapped niches in social media and in, in the pickleball realm in specific. Um, I mean, I, I've made a few videos, I think I've garnered like, I mean, just, just this month, like, uh, 1.5 million views. I like I got my highest performing video finally over a million this uh, a few days ago. I, I think right now it's at 1.2 and then I've got the the other one was like I created a new shot. That one has like 800,000 and there's there's it's actually if you think about it there's no way there's 800,000 people that are pickleball players watching that video. So it's 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 kind of getting pushed around in a different in a different niches not only is it trapped to the pickleball niche? But in regarding pros and what they can do with their brands, I mean, if you think about it, only I'd say less than 10% of pros have a true brand in which they are able to stand out with and eventually monetize. So for example, Tyson is a really good example. Yeah. Um, uh, ben, Ben, just because he's the best. I'm kidding. I mean, Ben, Ben, Ben has done a great job with his brand. Um, even like Callie Jo Smith, um, a great job with like her instructional stuff that garners a decent amount of views for a simple one take. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you really need to establish that brand. And one piece of advice that I would say for people is just don't be cliche. You can't be cliche. Um, as in like truly, if you want to do something and you have a personality, which everybody has a personality that stands out somewhere or the other, then lean on it. Like don't. Don't be so monotone. Don't be so forced into making another third shot drop video with no sort of nuance behind it or no sort of kind of personal spin behind it with your content. Um, 
also playing to your strengths. If you're really good at talking in front of a camera, then talk in front of a camera in every single one of your videos. If you're really good at editing, then edit, then learn how to edit and edit and be the best editor in Pickleball or anything like that. I think playing to strengths is big, especially in terms of content. If you think about it, it kind of differs than being a pro pickleball player because people can hit to your weaknesses in pro pickleball, but in terms of content, you could only show them your strengths if you really wanted. Um, so I would say those are a few tidbits. Um, if you want to get more technical, like trending audios, have a good hook, um, make sure you have sound cues, uh, stuff like that would help. Do you edit all your videos? It's a nuisance. What do you use? CapCut. Oh, okay. Which is annoying. Yeah. yeah. Damn. What is, it is annoying. It's just, uh, uh, it's just time consuming editing. Yeah. You know? hundred mm-hmm. percent. At what point are you going to grow your team? This is actually another thing in which it's kind of like, a. it, it helps me. It helps me in two ways, editing my own content. And the fact that first of all, like I'm a pro, which helps your brand in specific, but being able to film all of my videos or film, film all of your rec play and then go back and literally spend two hours watching yourself play subconsciously shows you the patterns that you perform well in shows you when you tend to miss shots. It shows you your strengths and weaknesses and you can go watch and, you know, just scroll and go like, let me replay that. Like I should have done this there. I should have done that there. And it teaches you a lot about the strategy. So if you're trying to improve, then just make content because you're forced to watch yourself over. Um, in terms of my editing right now, I don't think I'll get an editor until, I don't know. I'm just kind of stubborn. I should probably like just hire a VA or something like that and teach him like my editing style rather than, you know, cause I know an editor would be uh, a pretty hefty amount for somebody who hasn't fully monetized his Instagram yet and doesn't have a big presence on YouTube. Like some people in this room. Uh, Chris also. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so right now it's just, I'm just trying to crank out content and truly have a pretty high bar for sponsors um, yeah. because I don't want to truly dilute my stuff. I know that viewers will get a little pissy and so will I. I, I won't want to either if I'm just promoting stuff that I don't truly believe in or I, I, don't tr- I haven't tried out um, on myself. So... I mean, that's why I haven't fully monetized yet because I know I, you know, j- just just like what happens with you, whether it's YouTube or Instagram, you know, companies will reach out and they'll offer you money or some sort of affiliate. But if you don't even if you don't even believe in the product, then are you really going to chase that money? Hundred percent, yeah. And uh, I think it's a good time to say shout out Viore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. Like it just it shows you seem like the type of person where you're not just going to take money like. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that to a degree. I, I, I think we've talked about, I've talked about this before on other pod, like on other episodes. It's like, if money is your goal and if money is something that is important for you at that moment, then yeah, like you can do that. But like, if you have the opportunity to like say no to certain opportunities because you personally deep down inside don't feel comfortable with it, then that makes the most sense. Like, cause at the end of the day, what people want is authenticity. That's especially now like you see sam sulik that guy who grew what, what like to five million followers and like youtube subscribers in like a, less than a year and it's just like incredibly authentic authentic uh, hormozy is pretty authentic mm-hmm. uh yeah i think like authenticity is really just like the the key foundational element mm-hmm. um and you probably not you specifically but people don't want to stray away from that mm-hmm. like yeah cali joe smith it's awesome. Her content is just like, boom, it's like yeah, that. Yeah. And the replayability is like off the charts with that stuff. That's so true. Once again, another untapped niche. Callie found it. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there were probably some, some other creators, but she's truly mastered it. Yeah. Where it, it's so simple. She can do it in two minutes and film one video and the replayability will be like five times. Like it's absurd. It's awesome. Cause she'll <laughs> film like. 20 of those at the same event at the same yes. location you're like damn she yeah. figured out their her thing mm-hmm. it seems like the lowest hanging fruit but then she like like you said like you take it but then you like make it yours and that's what she was able to do mm-hmm. yeah and honestly one of the things that 
reaching out for reaching out to other accounts, whether it's inside or outside of pickleball, for for inspiration, uh, has really helped with this. For example, I don't know if you've watched any of Mr. Beast videos. He ties in his ads to his videos very well, where it doesn't fully seem like an ad. Like he's he's selling ad space, but he's selling it while still overlaying his video on top of it. So it's not like people are allowed to like skip through the ad. Because if you think about it, whether it's Spotify, whether it's YouTube, you can just skip the ads. But since he l truly ingrains it into his video, you're forced to still watch his video in order to, you know, kind of figure out where the video is going as well as, you know, get the ads here and there. Um, but he lays it into his video extremely well. And that's what I'm thinking of doing with my sponsors, which none... I haven't seen a pickleball account do that yet in which it's like, here's a cool point. Or maybe like I'm teaching an instructional video and then the ball machine's there. And then maybe I just like shout out the ball machine a few times, but it's an instructional video. So it's still a sponsored post. The only problem with that is that sponsors would likely pay less because they want to hear you talk about how good this ball machine is for 30 or a minute or something like that. So the post would likely be discounted in terms of what sponsors would want to pay. But I think that the viewers would like it a lot more. Yeah. Viewers will still consume the content and they'll still learn something out of it while it being a sponsored post in the background. So just 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 to throw out a bone um, for anybody, <laughs> for example, like if you want a cold plunge to sponsor you or something like that, you can instead of basically getting zero views or engagement by just doing a sponsored post about a cold plunge. You can get 10 times the views and engagement by doing a quick like speed round of questions where you're in the cold plunge and you shout out the cold plunge at the beginning, you shout out it in the middle or you shout out it at the end, but you're doing a speed round of questions and people see you using the product rather than you truly just like shoving it down your viewer's throat. Yeah, absolutely. I think someone said that clip about like Mr. Beast was like, it was he was in a coffin and then he was like i'm gonna write all my notes and then he was like using this notepad or like some organizer that was a sponsor mm -hmm. and i was like but yeah exactly what you're saying is like mm -hmm. very very true um hopefully you don't make a video about ball machines <laughs> yeah but uh <laughs> you know how i feel about this <laughs> yeah yeah i know it's it's tough because like the commission the, the commission on ball machines are out of this world i'm sure they're I mean, great and that's another thing it comes goes back to the like the in integrity of the part mm -hmm. and i won't call out any specific people but there's some people that i know who have taken that mm -hmm. offer and mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting sure. and so it's like like I'll, I'll i'll do a ball machine video but i'm definitely i'm doing it in like kind of on my standards yeah. and in a way in which i will be happy with the post i think people will get something out of the post while also promoting this rather than it's Rather, I mean, this is really going to ruin my chances with sponsors. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, I just want to do it in a more nuanced way, put simply. No, if anything, if anyone's watching this, they're going to want to sponsor you even more because you're being very like intentional about it. And there's a lot of people who just like start off their like being like, this is a sponsored post or a sponsored ad, and this is the product. And it sounds like they're reading off the script and you're just being very intentional about it. And you, and not in a way that's just intentional for the sponsor, but also the audience. Like you're looking out for both, both parties, which is great. So like 2023, you had some pretty memorable matches and then you also had your content goal. You're starting to build up your brand. You like, you know, you have your uh, sponsorship with ProXR. LS, mm -hmm. Elise? LS. LS. Like, think of the letters L and S. LS. Mm -hmm. um, what does the future look like for Jack Monroe? Honestly, as we talked about with LS or a few of my other sponsors, I like not blending in and kind of being a pioneer, whether it's through content or whether it's through the brands that sponsor me, it's just, or however I present myself, I like being that pioneer. Um, and discovering new niches, creating new shots, um, doing stuff like that. And that's how, that's one of the ways that I'd like to be recognized rather than, you know, just another rising pro or, anything like that um in terms of what the future holds i would love to obviously keep building a brand i mean at this point i was at like you know 2023 was like get my foot in the door with the tours as well as with content and i think i did a pretty good job with that whereas in like now instead of qualifying i'm in the main draw or now instead of 
just cranking out content and it, it kind of happens just just naturally or I have just so many clips in which I'm like three weeks ahead instead or something like that. Um, so I think I do have to shift the goalpost a little bit into where now it's like instead of qualifying a main draw, it's consistently find a way to medal or consistently find a way to maybe get two or three wins in a PPA or in terms of content, uh, keep trying to go viral is a pretty cliche one, <laughs> which I mean, um, whatever, that's a fine goal. But in terms of content, I would keep, um, keep up with consistency. I would keep trying to develop a new niche um, in pickleball, which there's so many. I mean, even I, I posted this on my threads, but a great example of finding a new niche in pickleball, it's relatively, um, that wasn't really uh, tapped into is Friday Pickleball. I mean, they, they've been doing this, I don't know, for like a year, but they've been in pickleball for a long time, but they've grown so rapidly. Granted, they have a really good background in social media, but they're a great example of tapping into a new niche. Just what like they, that. What's their niche? What did they do? Um, like, e even if it's like stereotypes or just like relatability um, with a good camera and it feels, and it feels like personal, it doesn't feel um, like it's not shot, like truly professional. Mm. Um, so they're a great example, but finding a new niche, creating new shots, keep uh, finding a way to um, keep pickleball interesting. I would also say one of the things is tapping into a um, the younger audience. Nothing against nothing nothing against the older audience, but you know, getting involved in college pickle, um, being the pioneer in college pickle. There's a lot of kids who are still on the fence with pickleball because they've never truly tried it yet. Getting them to maybe follow my account and see that pickleball is cool, like pickleball is, is fun. You can get out there with friends, you can hit trick shots, or you can, you know, just have a blast out there. I think that would be one of the things that I would love to hear as feedback from people when I go to tournaments is, you know, you got my kid into pickleball or, oh, you, uh, you know, college pickleball is a thing now because of you. That's awesome, dude. Um, I remember earlier in this conversation, that's like kind of what I thought is like, you're a great ambassador. Like, I don't know what makes a great ambassador, but like just you in the, your context, is just like, uh, someone with a good attitude, someone who's like w willing to help others out. Someone who's also willing to take part in like uplifting multiple different things like the college side, uh, the content side. You're also at a very young age too. So it doesn't, there's not that whole obstacle of people being like, oh, well, he's been doing this like his entire life. Like if someone was in their like thirties or forties, like you're like, you're 19 and you're able to show that like, Hey, like it, age doesn't matter. You could do it at this age. You can start now. And you're kind of saying like, you actually don't wait, just like start now. And, um, you've now you're, you've also like something that I think is very compelling to certain people is like the fact that you practice with Ben Johns and you just show like a lot of things that are possible, which is super cool. And then you also are very humble, which I think, I think that's probably like a good trait for an ambassador, someone who's very humble. Um, but yeah, that's all really great things. Um, this might tie into that question already, but like what impact do you want to leave on pickleball? Getting pickleball into the NCAA. <laughs> Um, getting colleges around, around every single state to compete on a local, regional, and national level. Um, having a collegiate nationals in which colleges are giving out scholarships because the money for nationals is actually a substantial amount. Yeah. Um, finding a way to maybe televise it or add some publicity around it. Um, as well as inspiring an even younger generation, not even college kids, but uh, younger kids, because I was one of the pioneers of the true first wave of pickleball kids. Because <laughs> I mean, as I told you, I started when I was 10. And it's, it's tough when you're that young to feel overwhelmed with, you know, a, a bunch of the older people that, you know, you, you find at the local courts. And being able to kind of be I don't want to say a symbol, but, you know, somebody who's been through it um, to show that you can. And even, even honestly, nothing beats playing, playing rec, like after a tournament, just playing with the kids after and just like having a blast. Nothing beats that because, I mean, first of all, it's fun. And 
it leaves such a big imprint on them because that's what happened to me when I was 11 or 12 is these guys would finish playing a tournament and then they'd play with me. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I just got to hit with Ben Johns. They're like, oh my God, I just got to hit with these, these top pros and they like gave me the light of day. And so that's one way I'd want to give back as well. Um, I still feel like that. <laughs> 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 um, in terms in terms of my sponsors, obviously, I want to see my sponsors truly evolve. So, for example, ProXR really succeed with Boundless and tap into that niche uh, in terms of LS. LS is Italian founded, based out of the UK, but now they're trying to get into the US, the the younger demographic of the states, and try to be like that uh, that trendier, even hippier brand. Not not hippier, um, but more hip brand. Um, and I would love to see them do that. That's obviously why I'd be a pretty good ambassador for them. I'd love to see them, um, love to see them kind of evolve as well. So, and then obviously grab a few medals along the way. That would be big. I don't think there's a better way to end this. I have like a ton of questions still on here, but maybe we could just save that for like the second one. Uh, cause it would obviously be awesome to get you back on. Like there's a lot of, uh, areas that we have overlap in, but you're just a, awesome guy to talk to you just made this very easy so i appreciate it um do you have actually like yeah where could people find out more information about you and if you have anything that i haven't asked you about that you want to talk about you know the floor is yours honestly in terms of in terms of like if people truly want to get better i would say film is one of the biggest things as we talked about before like watching yourself play uh even if it's like recording rec matches some people are weird with it but if you're in a decent enough group just like set up the tripod set up your phone if you're really looking to improve and film it and then instead of watching tv at night just watch it on your phone hook it up to your tv or something like that in order to watch it um as well as asking for feedback in your group if you're truly looking to improve and you're not just doing this recreationally um and you're in a good group of people ask every single one of them in, in a one-on-one -on -one type basis uh you could do it in a group but i recommend one-on-one -on -one. like hey what do you see as my strengths and weaknesses how do you think i can improve if you were to play me in a tournament, how would you try to break me down um, and stuff like that? And then you'll get a bunch of nuance from them like, oh, well, mentally you get in your own head. Maybe when maybe you get a bit timid um, when you have a forehand speed up that you should speed up or not. Or I simply find it so easy to speed up down your line because you have a chicken wing or all of this stuff that you can start maybe even drilling if you want to. Um, but ask people around you for feedback. Don't be scared to ask people for feedback. Um, in terms of where you can find me, uh, Instagram or TikTok at the Jack Monroe. Um, super easy. I'm trying to build a YouTube as well under Jack Monroe Pickleball. Right now it's just shorts, but hopefully some videos coming soon. Um, I also have a newsletter that I just started called Jack's Journal. It's a basically a public diary into the mind of a young pro and content creator. And it just spreads a bunch of nuance and hopefully you get a few tidbits out of it if you subscribe. So, yeah, no, I've... Uh got some useful stuff out of your newsletter. You mentioned two things, the importance of a circle and always batch your content. So, uh, yeah, you can find the link to his newsletter in his Instagram profile. And as far as the YouTube channel, absolutely. I'll link it in the description and give it a subscribe. So that way YouTube knows to notify you when he posts anything new. Um, obviously the content he posts is very, has holds value because on Instagram, very similar stuff I imagine right yeah and Instagram is has a blast with it um, I've seen your account grow tremendously over a past year that most people don't get uh, especially when you don't buy followers and, uh, that, seems, that seems to be a real problem <laughs> so yeah it's great man I appreciate you just uh, being someone with a, a lot of integrity that cares about the sport I mean, there's no better than combination than those two things um, for anyone to be in an industry. So appreciate it, man. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you having me on. I mean, yeah. you're way too kind. And I'm really looking forward to seeing both of us grow together. For sure, man. Mm -hmm. Dope. All right. Oh. No chance.